Well, good morning. So this is, I was asked to give a word of encouragement to the mothers. And this is a word of encouragement, but it's also a little bit of a call to action. So, so bear with me. Um, I, I want to start with my generation. We're, we're kind of millennials, and we're surrounded by influencers. They're people who are known for their follower basis. They're on social media, they're on YouTube, they're on all these big platforms, and they have millions of people that are following them. It's, it's a whole thing right now that my generation is kind of involved in, and... They, they tell people how they live, the clothes they buy, the places they shop, all these things that they, they teach people that, the way that they live, and then they get money by endorsements. And I say that because I think the world has enough of them. The world has plenty of that. But I'm asking, does the kingdom have enough moms that are mentors to the younger women? Are they teaching them how they raise their kids, how they submit to their husbands, how they keep their homes. Are they pouring into the upcoming mothers, to the, the young families? There are so many moms in this church, moms that have parents who have already, or moms that have kids that have already become parents, making them grandmas. Some women are great grandmas. Are there any great grandmas? Wow, that's pretty good. There's a lot of great grandmas. So that's, that's multi-generations of you bringing up your children, watching your children bring up children. And there's a lot of wisdom that comes from that. And there's a lot of women in this church that are in the word and they're in prayer and they have so much godly wisdom that they can impart into the generation coming up. I don't have any children yet, but I, I take notes. <laughs> I notice the women who are here faithfully with their husbands, with their young kids, and it, it inspires me and my husband to do that for our kids coming up, for me to be a mother of faith, a mother praying for her children, praying for my future children. So I'm here because your wisdom is needed, your transparency is needed. Being honest with my generation, we think everything has to be perfect. We think it all has to be orderly, perfect, shiny, brand new, sparkly. It doesn't have to be that way. And your transparency showing us that life is messy, but with God it's possible. You can bring children up. You can do all things through Christ. You can raise a family on a small income. You can raise a family on a big income. You can do a lot in your children's lives. So women, I'm encouraging you. Find a, find a mother, a godly mother, who's one season ahead of you, who has kids that are already grown or kids that are, um, maybe your kids are toddlers, maybe find a mom who has kids in middle school. If you, like me, I'm not a mom yet, I'm going to look for a mom who has young kids, because that's my next season. Find a woman who can pour into you, so you can pour out into the next down the line. Your faith is needed, and it is admired, and it is welcomed. Don't be afraid to approach someone. Find someone to mentor and to pour into. Go for coffee. It doesn't have to be a play date. Give your kids to a babysitter. Sit down with a woman. Pour into her. Let someone pour into you. We're here for each other. Point each other back to Jesus. Point each other back to the Word. We can do it all if we pour into each other. My generation needs it. Let me tell you, we need it. We need all the help we can get. So please, please, this is, this is an encouragement. This is a call to action. Please pour into each other. And I have a scripture from Titus 2. Titus 2, verses 3 through 5. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame to the word of God. Thank you. Amen.
All right, well, this morning we have one of our very own up and rising ministers within the church, and uh, this is a great sister in the Lord. You're going to enjoy what God has placed upon her heart. On be it may or may not be of Mother's Day content, but either way, it's the Word of God, and it's a woman of God, and so how can we go wrong? Amen. Amen. So I want you to make welcome one of our very own, Sister Sandy Ortiz, as she comes to minister God's Word. Amen. Good morning, Agape. Man, happy Mother's Day, all you mamas out there. Happy Mother's Day. All right, how many of us have our Bibles with us this morning? Amen. Or your phone or whatever, your electronics. So, man, how many of us was it a battle just to get here this morning, right? But guess what? There were so many hands that said, I need a victory, I need a victory. You have the victory because you're here. Amen? You already have a victory. Isn't that amazing? God is already working in your life. He is already doing something incredible because you made the choice in spite of everything to get out of bed and clean your eyes, brush your teeth, I hope, and get here in the presence of God. Amen? So you already have a victory. So we're going to start off with some prayer this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you, Lord, for every... Uh, woman in this house today, Lord, every man that is here to encourage them, Father God, the children, Father, that you have blessed us with, Heavenly Father God, I thank you, Lord, for the honor of being able to come into your presence this morning, Father God, and to just pour out into your children, Father, as I decrease, Lord, may you increase and flow out through me, Father, and that you will be a blessing to your children today. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. All right, so I am going to turn to um, 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 14 this morning. And I'm going to, I actually have my husband printed out. Thank you for husbands, amen. And um, because I really like the way it read in the NLT um, this morning. So it says this, and, it, and he's speaking to Timothy, but how many of us know that God's word is for everybody, amen? So women, I want you to put the, your name in here this morning, okay? But you, Timothy, are a man of God. So run from all these evil things. Pursue righteousness and a godly life along with faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have declared so well before many witnesses. Are there witnesses in the house today? And I charge you before God who gives life to all, and before Christ Jesus, who gave a good testimony before Pontius Pilate, that you obey this command without what? Without wavering. Then no one can find fault with you from now until our Lord Jesus Christ comes again. Amen. How many of us know as moms that we have a fight? I mean, we have to fight just to bring these babies into the world. Amen. It starts with a fight. Not only that, that we have to run a, a, a faith walk, amen? We have to run with faith, and we cannot waver. How many times as a mama you want to waver and give up? I know I have. I, I'm, everything I'm going to speak to you today, ladies, I want you to know that you're not alone. And I'm here to give you a word of encouragement today. If there's a title to my message, it would be Don't Give Up. Because as moms, so many times we want to give up. Even in the labor process as we're delivering these little angels into the earth that we think are just going to be such a blessing to our heart. And they're just going to love us forever. And they're just going to just do everything great and take care of us when we're old. And, oh, I got a best friend for life now. And they come into the world kicking and screaming and ripping us apart. Amen? <laughs> I mean, let's just be honest. From the first moment that we are trying to bring them into the world and they're giving them breath. We gave them breath through fighting, through pain. Amen? And you think you're not going to have pain for the rest of your life. Come on. They came into the world causing us pain. Amen? And we love them, but it's a faith walk. And we can't waver as they grow up. And so I was praying and I was asking the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to, you know, speak on? What do you want me to say? What do you want me to do? And so if you want to turn with me to 1 Kings 17, chapter 10, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory. I'm going to talk about three different women this morning. The first woman, the first woman is the widow of Zarephath. 
Now, I want you to understand that during this time, there was a famine in the land. There was a drought in the land, right? Elijah had spoke the word of God and told the people that there was not going to be rain until he said so. And because there was no rain, it caused a famine. This widow woman was a foreigner. So that means she wasn't an Israelite. She was a foreigner. She wasn't saved. She knew who God was, but she really didn't have relationship with God. And I know maybe there are some of you today that have come in because you were invited, because you felt like you wanted to come, and, and you kind of know who God is, and you know, you know there is a God, however, it's born to you. Everything we did this morning, all the worship and, and the word and the prayer, it's born to you. But I want you to know that even as a foreigner, even as somebody who maybe isn't in the will of God, God loves you. He sees you. He sees your children. He cares about you. And if you don't believe me, there's evidence in 1 Kings 17, 10, when there was a widow woman who was a foreigner that God came to through the man of God. And it says this. And we're talking about Elijah here. And he says, so he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. There's a drought going on. Remember this. And as she was going to get it, he even went further. He called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. There's a famine going on. Wow, the gall, right? The audacity but she said to him as the Lord your God see I wasn't lying she wasn't saved as the Lord your God lives I have no bread only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar and behold I am gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die see her victory in her mind, in her way, was going to be, we're going to have a last meal and we're going to die. And we're in death, that's going to be our victory. She was just about to give up. But God said, I'm not done with you, woman. I'm not done with your son, woman. I'm going to send a man of God. There's some of you out there today, whether you be on the web or in this house, that you're just ready to eat your last meal and die. This is your last meal. I'm going to come to church, and if I don't get nothing today, that's it. I'm thrown in the towel. And God said, I'm not done with you. I have a word for you today, a word of encouragement. And then Elijah said to her, do not fear. Go, do as, as you have said, but make me a little bread and cake from it first. And bring it out to me, and afterwards you, make, you may make one for yourself and for your God. When you have nothing and God is asking you for everything, how many of us know that that takes faith? Amen? That takes faith. See, she had to know who God was at least. Even if she didn't call him her God, she knew there was a God and she wasn't ready to throw in the towel because she had the faith enough to go and make that bread and use it and give it to the prophet first. Amen? See, if she had no faith, if she had no fight left in her, she wouldn't have even attempted to give it to the man of God. She would have been like, nope, this is mine. I don't even know what you're talking about. Forget you. Go on your way, man of whoever you are. Because this is all I have left. See, if you all were really, truly, some of you are ready to give up and surrender and throw in the towel and say, I have nothing left. My children are on the street. My husband left me. I'm a widow. I I'm a single mom. I'm this, I'm that, and everything else. And my kids haven't even called me this morning, and it's already going to be 11 o'clock. I'm done. See, but you're not ready to throw in the towel because you're here. You're not ready to give up. There, I, it tells me that there is a little bit of faith left in you, ladies. Something deep inside of you says there's a God who loves me and there's more to this than just a little bit of flour and a little bit of oil. I'm not going to just eat it and die today. There's a God who loves me. And I want you to know that that's true. So you have some fight left in you, women. And it says this.
this, it goes on to say, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty, until the day the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. Your jar may be empty. You may have a little bit of flour, but the Lord says, It's raining today, ladies. It's raining today. It's raining. Today is your day because I have sent the rain. And the famine is over and the drought is about to end because I've sent the rain into your life of the Holy Spirit. And that seed that you planted and that little bit of oil and that little bit of flour, I'm about to multiply it. Because I have a plan for you and I have a plan for your children. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. Amen? For many days. She had to do something. See, the first step was getting here. The second step is listening to the word of God. And the third step is being obedient to what God has for you today. What he's speaking into your heart. Well, how he is saying, this is how I'm going to make a way out for you. If she wouldn't have done it, she would have died. And so would her seed. But I want you to know that God has something great in store for your seed. Amen? I want you to skip down with me to, chapter, uh, to verse 17. Look what happens. Isn't it just like... The enemy. Here, he won her over. She's seen the faith. They ate. She lived. And now look what happens. In verse 17 and 18. Now it came about after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And this sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. So she said to Elijah, What do I have to do with you? O oh, man of God, you have come to me to bring my iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. How many times as moms do we blame ourselves for the troubles of our children? And especially our adult children. You know, it's just like the enemy to throw it in our face. Here we find God, we're serving God, we're in the house of God, we're like, thank you, Jesus, you saved my children, you saved me. And you know, our children aren't always going to stay safe sometimes. Right. Praise God for the ones like my husband who do. But that's not the truth. And many times, Brother Joey, he was raised, he served God all his life. You listen to his testimony. But then you got rebellious ones like Brother Chad. Just kidding, just kidding. No, but I mean, there, you know, our children stray. Our children stray. And first thing we do, oh, it's the sins of the father coming back to haunt me. Oh, I didn't, I wasn't a good mommy. I didn't hug them enough. I didn't breastfeed them. Oh my gosh, I'm a bad mom. That's why they're in trouble today. They didn't get enough love. They didn't get enough attention. And, you know, we start to beat ourselves up. And then because we're beating ourselves up, our children start to blame us. Let's be honest. Right? Amen. It's your fault I have this addiction. It's your fault I'm out on the street. It's your fault my marriage is falling apart and I didn't graduate and you didn't support me enough and you didn't put me in gymnastics. How dare you? If you would have put me in gymnastics, I, just, I would have been so much better and so much more confident and I could have done some things. <gasps> How dare you work and have to miss my softball game? You know, that's what happens. And we start to say, see, it's all my fault. God, you're doing this because you're putting my sins back on me. But what happens? God loves us. He says, it's not your fault. Things happen. Let me tell you, if there's one perfect childhood in this place, please raise your hand. Come on. Don't be afraid of your parents. Don't raise your hand because you're lying. They're not going to slap you. Nobody had a perfect trial. You know, Joe and I do foster care, and we have kids who have gone through things as, as our own biological children, and I tell them, you tell me a perfect kid. You tell me somebody who was raised in perfection. We all have drama. We all have drama, but what are you going to do with that? I'm talking to the young adults and to the teenagers and to the babies, and even some of you adults who still have mama and daddy issues, and you're still struggling to serve the Lord because your mama didn't hug you enough. Give me a break. Amen. Because as we become adults and as we become as the age of knowing and the age of being able to take accountability for ourselves, come on. Your mama and your daddy issues have nothing to do why you're living a life of sin or why you can't get the fullness of God and why you're not set free. Amen. What happened to you happened to everybody. Let me tell you that. 
Get over it. Because you have a God who loves you and wants so much more for you. Amen? I tell, I tell my children all the time, let me break this down for you. The average lifespan is about 83 years old. The average childhood is 18. And maybe 8 to 10 years of that kind of stinks. Right? And let's just go even further and say the whole 18 years stunk. And you got 83 years of life. 83 years of life. So you're going to let 18 years determine the rest, what, 65 years? Do the math. 60 some years is going to, you're going to be affected by 18 years, by 10 years, by three years. But let's go bigger because we're eternal beings, amen? And we are created for eternity. So you're going to let 18 years affect your whole eternity of where you're going to spend your life. Come on. That's not what God has in store for you. You're in the house today to be set free and to get some victory. And it says this. So in 19 it says, and he said to her, give me your son. How many times has God asked us to give us their, our children to him? How many times does he ask to ask you, give me your children? Give me your children. Oh, no, Lord, I can't. I can't. I don't trust you. I need to hold on to it, but I got to keep them safe. And I know they hate me, and they don't love me. And sometimes I can't stand them, but I'm going to keep them right here in my pocket. I'm not going to release them. I'm going to continue to be the God of their life because I'm going to save my children. But today God's saying, give me your son. Amen. Give me your daughter. And I know that as a mom, it's very hard to do. Yes. Very hard to do. Even as adults, I've had to walk this out. I want you to understand that. And I still waver sometimes. But it says in 1 Timothy, what? Do not waver. Without waver, you fight the good fight of faith. And you surrender those babies at the altar to God. Yes. And look what happens when we do. He says, then he took from her bosom and carried him up to the upper room where he was living and laid him, on, laid him on his bed. And he called out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord my God, hast thou also brought calamity to the widow with whom I am staying by causing her son to die? Then, look what he did. He stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord. When's the last time you breathe life into your children instead of always berating them and putting them down and, and talking negative? No, he breathed life. He breathed the Holy Spirit into him. See, I have had to learn that my kids don't want me to correct them. They just want me to love them. They just want me to spend time with them, put my phone away, put, put the computer away, turn the TV off, and devote some time to them and breathe life into them. Because then when they know that you're proud of them in any circumstance, you're going to be able to breathe the breath of life into them because you're going to have their ear and you're going to capture their heart because now they know, okay, mama loves me. It doesn't matter if I'm not going to college right now or, or if I'm not even working right now or maybe, you know, something is going on in my life, but my mama loves me. And she is, loves me enough to put the phone away, to turn off the computer and just listen to me. Just let them talk. They don't want to hear everything. You've been talking to them for all their life. Sometimes they just want you to listen, moms. And as you listen, you can breathe the breath of life. He stretched himself off on this little boy, and he breathed life into him. And he said, Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's life return to him. When is the last time you have prayed for your children and asked for their life? Not, Lord, give them correction. Lord, give them, you know, a job. No, just ask them, Lord, just give them life and life abundantly. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the life of the child returned to him and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. Do you know that when we give our children to God, he'll give them back? but in a better version. Amen? In a much better version. I want the best version of my kids, and the only way I can get the best version of my kids is by surrendering them to God and allowing God to do what he needs with them. Amen? And sometimes that takes some things to die, right? Sometimes we feel like our children are dead. Sometimes they have to die spiritually 
physically, die to sin, die to addiction, die to their self, to pride, to all these things. But they never will if we keep holding on to them. If we keep enabling them, ladies. See, this mom didn't give up. She saw the miracle. And because of her faith and her fight, they were saved. Amen? In 24, it says, Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and the word of the Lord, not your Lord, now it's her Lord. Amen? The word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. See, he became her Lord. She didn't refer to him as your Lord anymore. She saw the miracle. She saw with her faith, and she was saved. Amen? Don't give up, ladies. Where's your fight? In 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, if you'll turn there with me, we're going to talk about another one. Second Kings uh, chapter 4, and we're going to go verse 1 through 7, and I'm going to break this down verse by verse, amen? <clears throat> it says, Now a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elijah, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. This woman was saved. How many saved women do we have out there today, Amen. You're in the house. You're saved. You have a relationship with God. And sometimes we still feel forsaken. See, just because we come to the Lord, I love what it said, something out there on the sign not too long ago, that serving God doesn't say that nothing will come, but it just means, or it won't be easy, but we'll get through it. Amen? I'm totally paraphrasing. I wrecked it. But, but seriously, see, we may be in the house, and we may be saved, and we may be you know, loving the Lord, and then we get so mad at him because he says, why, Lord? Man, I served you. My husband served you. We gave it all. We paid tithe even, Lord. We gave it all. I was a Sunday school teacher. I was a nursery director. I did it all. And yet, here, the enemy is coming to take my children. He's, you're not exempt, ladies, but God is with you. He loves you. Just because you're in the house and you're doing God's work and, and all that you're supposed to be and you're in God's will, it doesn't mean your children have their own choices. Your spouse has their own choices. Sometimes we're going to lose a spouse to natural causes, to life, to decisions. That doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It means that's life. And sometimes people make bad choices. So this woman was saved, and Elijah said to her, what shall I do for you? God's asking you, what do you want today? Mom, this is your day. What do you want? Tell me, what do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house. But look at this word, except a jar of oil. See, our nothing gives God something to work with. See, this lady thought she had nothing, but our nothing gives God something to work with. What we see is nothing, Lord, it's just a little jar of oil. Lord, it's just a little seed of faith. That's nothing, ladies. But what we see is nothing. God takes it and he turns it into something and he gives us provision and he gives us life and he brings back to life with what we thought was nothing, but that seed of faith is getting watered. That seed of faith, he's, she's surrendering it to the man of God and she's listening to the man of God and God says, you don't have nothing, you have something. And as long as you have breath, that's something that God can work with. Amen. Understand that. As long as your children are breathing, that is something that God can work with. There is hope, and there is a miracle coming, because there's something. Amen? So many times we see we have nothing, Lord. What did Pastor Chad say this morning? We're broke. Are you? Are you really broke, or are you really greedy? Or are you really scared and have no faith? Come on. God will take something, nothing, and make it out into something, something great. Amen? Then he said, go, borrow vessels at large for yourself, from all your neighbors, look at your neighbor, even empty vessels, do not get a few. How many of us know you're sitting by somebody that might be empty today and they need you? See, he didn't say do it by yourself, he said this is a community. Amen. It takes a village. 
He didn't say, just give me what you have and I'm going to just... No, he said, you have a community of neighbors. Yeah. Go and borrow and share. She had to humble herself. Sometimes we have to humble ourselves. And we need to go to that brother or sister, that man of God, and say, I need help. I'm dying. I feel empty. I have nothing. Amen. I have nothing, but can you take what I have left of my breath and give me something? And what did that take? That took the neighbor's doing something. It will take you to do something. Right, Kylie? They need mentors. Amen. Amen. We need mentors. We need each other. Yes. This woman had to go out and humble herself and say, I have a problem. I'm about to lose my sons. And that's going to cause me to lose my mind. But what you have, I need, and it could help save my life. See, what you have, somebody else might need. Somebody else might need, but that takes you opening your door. Amen. See, if she could go knock on the doors and say, hey, I need something, I need something. Hi, it's the Jehovah's Witnesses. Don't look at the door. They just want to come over here and say something. Don't. Nobody's home. Look on your little camera. We all have video cameras on our doors now, right? Don't lie. You know you look and see if you want to answer. Yeah, can you imagine if they had cameras back then? Oh, don't answer that lady. She's crazy. She probably needs something. No, it took the neighbors to open a door. It's going to take you to open the door and let somebody in. Amen? Are you willing to let somebody in one-to-one? -one? Pastor's vision was one-to-one. -one. How many of you, don't raise your hand because I don't want you to get in trouble. How many of you have actually called? How many of you have gotten a phone call and like, yeah, that's that brother again. I ain't answering it. I know what it's all about. Shame on you. Just being honest. Open the door and let somebody in. They need you as much as you need them. In verse 4 it says this. And you shall go in and shut the door behind you and your sons behind you and your sons. And pour out into all these vessels and you shall set aside what is full. Again, sometimes, sometimes we need to shut the door behind us. Sometimes our children just need us. We need to shut the noise out. We don't need to have company. We don't need to invite the whole world because you're afraid to get real with your kids. So you're trying to deflect. As long as I have company, I don't have to listen to my kids. No, sometimes you need to get into a room, shut the door behind you with your children, and go to work, mamas. You need to go to work. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons. They were bringing the vessels to her and she poured. How many of us know that once we pour into our sons and our children and we surrender them, they're going to start working with you in the body of Christ. They're going to come alongside you and do something. They're going to bring you the people. Here, here, Mama, here's my friend. He needs minister too. Here's my friend. Here's my wife. Here's my babies, Mama. I need you to help me with my babies because you helped me and you were such a good mama and I don't know how to raise these babies. I need your help. They're going to start bringing them to you and asking you for your help and working alongside you. And it came about when the vessels were full that she said to her sons, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not one vessel more. Moms, we cannot stop until the job is finished. Amen? You cannot stop running the race until there's no more. God says it's done. It's finished. But if God hasn't said it's done and it's finished, that means you better keep bringing those vessels. You better keep pouring out. You better keep filling those jars. You better keep working, Mom. You better keep running. You better stop and start fighting. She didn't stop until it was finished. What would have happened if she wouldn't have? What would have happened if they said, okay, I'm tired, no more. I have nothing left in me, it's okay. You think they would have lived? You think they would have had the provision? No, you want the provision, you can't give up. You want the salvation, you want to see the victory, then stop stopping before the end of the line. You can't stop before the finish line and expect to finish the race. See, there's the finish line, and some of us are so tired and so broken and so just, I'm tired of working here. This is it. This is where my race ends. That's not victory. That's defeat. Yes. 
That's defeat. We don't get the victory until we cross the finish line. And we don't stop until it's finished. Amen? Then she came and told the man of God. And he said, go sell the oil and pay your debt. And you and your sons can live on the rest. See, she didn't finish. She fought. She had faith. She knew how to get God's attention. You know, you're in the house and you've forgotten how to get God's attention. You forgot how to get the prophet's attention. Ladies, you're saved and you're set free and you're living in defeat. Because you forgot how to get to the feet of, the, of God. You forgot how to get to the altar. You forgot how to say, whoa, I need a prophet. Amen. Yeah. I need a prayer over here. She didn't forget. She knew. She said, wait a minute, I have seed in the ground and I need it watered. Because I gave my life to the ministry. I gave my life to God. My husband and I, we toiled the land and we worked it and we put our hands to the plow and we didn't look back. And just because he's gone, I ain't looking back now. I see what's in front of me, but that's not what God has for me. I'm going to go find me a man of God. I'm going to go find a prophet. I'm going to go find a neighbor and I'm going to get my victory and my sons will be saved and they will not be taken. Amen? Because they were getting taken by a debtor. But guess what? We have a God. We have a Jesus. He paid our debt. So there is no debt collector coming after your children. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Because our debts have been paid. Amen? And she knew that and she didn't give up. And because of that, her sons were saved, ladies. If you give up, there's no hope. As long as you have breath and a fight in you, there is hope. Here's the third woman. We're going to go to 1 Samuel. Chapter 1, verse 10 and 11. And she said, great, and so we're talking about Hannah, again, the backstory, okay? How many of you know Hannah was the second wife, right? And she had no children, and the first wife always tormented her and taunted her. How many of us know sometimes women like to taunt other women? Let's be real. And if that's you... I'll meet you at the altar over here and we'll lay hands on you. Amen? Get you some prayer. Get you some freedom. Some self-esteem. Amen? So she was barren and she was crying out to the Lord. In 1 Samuel 1, 10 and 11, and she says this, And she, greatly distressed, prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou will indeed look on, my, on the affliction of thy maidservant and remember me and not forget thy maidservant, servant, but will give, me, give thy maidservant a son, then I will give him back to the Lord all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come on his head. I'm going to get real, real, real here, okay? Some of us have prayed and cried out, God, just give me a child. And now, instead of giving that child back to God, that child has become your idol. See, we prayed, Lord, I just want a child. Lord, just get my children saved. Lord, just, I just need a baby. Lord, I just want a baby. And God answered our prayers, and he gave us those babies. And now there are idols. And we wonder why we're suffering. Because they've become our God. They become our God. Oh, I can't go to church today because my baby don't want to. We brought our kids in pajamas. I'm being honest. I wouldn't have done it. That was my husband. But they came. And I'm not talking they were babies. I'm talking they were teenagers. And they showed up to church in their pajamas. Oh, you don't want to get ready and get up? Oh, well, you better get in that car. And they came in like that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> Yeah. You know, oh, I can't do it today because they're fighting. My brother brought his two kids to church in the same t-shirt. Not like different t-shirts, like they were both stuck in a t-shirt because they wanted to fight. And then they had to sit there in church. That's the truth. He wasn't going to let it ruin his praise. Amen? Why are you letting your kids ruin your praise? Amen. Kids were meant to be a blessing, not an idol. And we are not their God and they are not ours. But Hannah was faithful. See, we need to take a, a note from Hannah. Hannah got her blessing and honored her promise. 
In 1 Samuel 2, 21, it says the Lord gave her three more sons and two daughters. She didn't give up. She had to take her son when he was winged and said, here you go. How hard would that be? Can you imagine that? Here you go. Here's my child. And she didn't look back. She trusted the Lord with her child, with the promise that he gave her. And because of that, that promise was multiplied five times over. Amen? Amen. When we trust God with our promise and not try and take hold of it and, and make that promise happen on its own, but we trust God to give us that promise. And when that promise is fulfilled and we surrender that promise back to the Lord, it's multiplied. Yes. He multiplied her promise because of her faithfulness. She didn't give up. She fought at the altar. She knew how to fight through prayer, through worship, and through reminding God of who she was and who he was in her life. And because she knew that and because she fought for that, God blessed her. And because when she got her blessing, she didn't surrender and, and walk away from God because so many times we do. Let's be honest. We get our blessing and we're out the door and we never see you again. If you're on the internet, get back in the house. I got my blessing. See you later. No, she honored her vow and she surrendered that promise and he multiplied it. Isn't that amazing? Y'all should be clapping for that because that woman got a promise and a multiplication. You, you, all, you don't want multiplication? See, I tell you, women don't celebrate each other sometimes. We should be Hannah's biggest cheerleader. Woo! You know? Come on. But here's the thing, there are many women today, today, these are all true and true women of our history, but there are women today who have not given up. Be encouraged, ladies. There are mentors around you. I'm just going to mention a couple of them real quick, and we're going to get ready to close in a few minutes, because I know your husband's got something really special planned for you today. Amen? And if not your husband's, your children. You know, how about when your child is diagnosed with a learning disability? You know, it'd be real easy to give up. And not just give up, but keep them by your hip and say, that's it. They're going to live with me forever. They're not going to go any further. But you know what? When Sister Alicia was faced with that, she knew how to fight. She didn't give up. She got on her knees and she advocated for her daughter and she fought and she reminded the Lord of who she was and who God was in her life. And that little girl just made the news article of the newspaper and was student of the month. Come on. Because her mama didn't give up. You know, it reminds me of a few other women. I was like, Lord, why am I preaching on widows so much? But you know, widows were wives, widows were mothers, you know, they became single mothers. There's women who've had to bury their children. You want a mentor? Look to your youth pastor, Sister Olivia. No mama should have to bury their child. You want a mentor? Look to Auntie Abri and Sister Becky, my mother-in-law, and probably many of others, but I know them personally, and I know they had to bury a child. And when you have to bury a child, Mother's Day takes a whole new meaning for you. Right? A whole new meaning. It's not natural. But it is life sometimes, sadly. But these women found their fight. They found their fight, and every day they get out of bed, and they're breathing. And so they say, Lord, because I'm breathing, I know I have seed in heaven, and I know the God I serve, and I know the victory is coming, and I will be victorious, and I will keep living, and I will keep breathing, and I will keep serving God, and I will get myself to the house, and I will find a woman to minister to and to pour into. And I am not going to lay down and die. I'm going to fight. How about let's go a little further. We're all in the Pueblo community, and we know a little over a year and a half we had something very tragic, not in the community alone, but in the Christian community. You know, there are many children who have gotten their lives caught up in addiction in Pueblo, Colorado. Many children. 
Not one of you can be in this room and say you don't know somebody that has struggled with addiction and may still be. Our nephew got caught up in the life of addiction. And his parents fought for him every day, every day, every day. They didn't give up. And about a year and a half ago, and they were men and women of God. He was a pastor in this town, Pastor Roman Ortiz. Many of you probably know him. He is my husband's brother, my mama's son. Mother's Day is a whole new meaning for this woman. And he fought for his son until his last breath because the addiction killed him. Not our nephew. Our nephew is doing time right now. But it was the addiction that got the better of him that caused the death of my brother-in-law. Now we have a mama who buried her husband and her son did it and her son's in prison. Mother's Day takes a whole new meaning for her. Sister Rosine, that woman, if any of us have a reason to lay down and die and give up, tell me that's not a reason. Tell me that wouldn't get some grace and mercy from God and he would just have to understand. I buried my husband because of the actions of my son and now my son's in prison. And they were pastors. Gave their whole life to the ministry. This woman found her fight. She is not perfect and she is still on her way, but she found her fight. Last night in Denver, Colorado, she was up there with her fight in an outreach. She is planning a trip to Africa to take her fight to the women of Africa. She has given her testimony in this town. She has continued to keep that church going forward. And is it perfect? No. But she's fighting. She has breath and she has life. And she didn't give up. And she said, Lord, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to have breath. And you know what? Because of her fight, her son may be behind bars, but he is addiction free. He is set free. He is not a drug addict right now in this moment in time. And he is not. And he is walking in his call and he is having Bible studies. And I don't care. You guys can judge to the end of the earth. But you know what? His daddy would have done it a million times over if it would have set his son free. It was not in vain. It was not in vain, ladies. Sometimes things happen, but understand, it's not in vain. Because God can take nothing and do something great with it. See, they would have thought he's a nothing. Just an addict on the street. It happened. Some of us have looked at our children and, and other people have said they're nothing. I want you to know what the world sees as nothing. God sees as something great. God sees as something victorious that he can use to set people free. But we have to keep the fight of faith without wavering. Without wavering. I'm going to close with this. I was doing a study, and it's called Tight Ropes and Teeter Totters by Lisa Pennington. If you guys haven't done it, it's an amazing study. It's on your Bible app. It was pretty life-changing. And it says this. You are the determining factor in how a situation will go. How you think about life, what God has given you, who you are as a person, who your children are in God's eyes, and what your purpose is will determine how quickly you can recover from a spill. Do you know that there are only 940 Saturdays from the time your child is born until he or she is 18? And 260 of them are gone by your child's fifth birthday. I could cry just thinking about it. It is such a short, short amount of time. Let's not waste it blowing up over little things and spilt or letting spilled crackers ruin our days. How do you think of life? Is it a gift? Do you thank God for it every single morning? Being aware of the value of life, both yours and your child's, is essential to changing your attitude about hard situations. You can see even the spills as gifts. You get to stop whatever you're doing and teach a lesson on whatever needs to be done to clean up the mess. 
You can spot a weak area in your child and make plans to work on that. For every obstacle is an opportunity for something. What has God given you? Oh, my word, so much. See what God has given you. Ask him to open your eyes. Everything around you is a gift, even the hard things. Who are you? You are a child of the king, moms. You were created for purpose, moms. You are blessed among women, moms. You are beautiful and talented and amazing. You have the capability to be a light for this world through your faith and through, and, and, and you're, you are a gift to your children, moms. Who are your children? Gifts, not just to you, but to the world. Your children can be world changers, life explorers, and hopefully Christ followers. They are special, brilliant, beautiful, and talented. And you are not the only one who sees that. God sees, other people see. And he is preparing a path for each of them filled with people who will serve their lives in some way. Don't ever forget that you being their mom is only a part of their identities, ladies. Amen? Your children are blessed and highly favored. You are blessed and highly favored. And today I want you to know that and be encouraged about that. I want all the moms to stand. First and foremost, I can't end this message without giving a call to salvation. I want us all to close our eyes, bow our heads, and make this personal. See, maybe there's someone who just came in today and knows God but doesn't really know God and thinks everything here is foreign but felt a tug and said, you know what, I want that. I want that hope. And they've never given their lives to God. Today's your day. So without anybody looking around and with all our eyes closed, I just want you to lift that hand if you need salvation today. Maybe you had salvation and maybe you lost it. Maybe you walked away and you said, Lord, today's my day. I want to come home. And I see those hands. God sees those hands. And because we are a community and a body of Christ, I want you all to pray this with me. Father, I know that I'm a sinner. And Lord, I know that you sent your only begotten son. I know that he died for my sins on the cross so that I could receive salvation through the blood of Jesus. I know that he rose three days later and he is seated at the right hand of God, interceding for me. Today, I want to make him my Lord. I ask you, Jesus, come into my heart. Cleanse me, set me free, and reignite that fight, that hope, and that walk of faith. In Jesus' name, I give you my heart. I surrender it all today. Amen. If you've never been saved, I want to welcome you to the body of Christ. If you walked away, I want to welcome you home. I want all the ladies to stand. I don't care if you're not a mom. You're a future mom. You're a mentor. You're a spiritual mom. You are somebody's light, ladies. So this is for all of you today, not just one, not just some. I want all the ladies of the house to stand. If you are an adult woman, please stand. And I want, if you, first we're gonna, we're gonna have all of you come forward, but the first ones I want to come forward and I don't want you to be embarrassed because you were amongst family, sisters, and friends. But maybe you lost your fight. Maybe you need that fight ignited. Maybe you need some lifting up and some hands laid on you. And you, need, you just need your sisters. You need your neighbors. Amen? Maybe you think you have nothing left, but God says you have something. I want you to be the first ladies to come down here, please. Because there's some ladies that need their arms lifted up today, women. If you're one of those women who have lost their fight and you just need something today, 
I want you to come, and I don't want you to be ashamed, and I don't want you to be embarrassed, because we love you. We love you. I want all you women to see these ladies, because they need you, neighbor. They need you to open a door. And now, women, this is where you all get to participate. I want you to come and surround these women, and I want you to come forward, all of you, all the women of the house. And when they're finished, when you're all finished coming, I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Larry. And he's going to bless us with a prayer. And he's going to pray over us as the pastor of this house, as the shepherd of this house, as the man that God has chosen. So Pastor Larry, if you come up, and it's going to be his show from here. After he's done praying and whatever he wants to do, Brother Faustine, if you want to get your men ready, because we think you guys are beautiful roses. Amen? And some of you are ready to bloom. Some of you have already bloomed. Some of you might still have some thorns. We can get them off. And the men are going to, after we're done, I want you to wait and get your roses. And then I want you no one to leave, ladies. Okay, because we have some special giveaways. Some special giveaways. Sister Daisha, she's our women's leader. Daisha, can you come up here for a minute? If you guys haven't been to the women's breakfast or you don't know, this young woman in a time when nobody else wanted to and in a time of fear, right? In a time of pandemic and isolation, she said, I'll take the women's on. And she did. And so I want you to know you have a women's leader who loves you and, and that women's breakfast is amazing. You should come. So she's going to um, be in charge of the giveaways this morning. So if she doesn't pull your ticket, blame her, not me. Amen. <laughs> But I may hand it over to Pastor Larry, and he's going to pray. There's a very special moment right now. So I just want to take our time. We're not in a hurry. You can wait for the rose, and you can wait for the gifts. What you saw come up this morning was about a half a dozen ladies that are really facing some very heavy emotions and trials. And they're already being surrounded by a few. And that's a good thing but the rest of you ladies have come up and maybe you're not it's maybe not as intense for you but I think each of you can pray with each other so even though you may not have your hands on those that came and I thank you ladies that you sisters that are putting your hands upon those that are really hurting but those of you that may not be at that place of hurting you still need to maybe pray for one another so those of you ladies that are on the perimeter why don't you just put your hands on each other's shoulders just, just touch, everybody touch somebody, all you ladies, all you moms.